some more informal discussion. Um, although I do want to say too that for those who are leading this event or down the street to the center event, um, that would be a good time. I'm waiting for Lisa to come back because I think she's going to. Many. We, we were able to do some fundraising for uh, for some community to be able to attend. So I'll wait for Lisa to come back. Anyway, so we should just keep talking. About make an observation. Um, I think there's an underlying language going on above the people who are running the development process that thinks of people with fewer resources as, well, not quite trash, but close. And thinks of the people that are what they want to attract um, as educated upper class, etc. Et et so so yeah. the condominiums that were mentioned around Travis Park, even our speaker presumed that who was living there. And I think that that's probably right. Um, I moved here part time from the West Coast 20 years ago for, for America. But I still teach in California. I'm about ready to retire as a college professor. And I'm looking for a community. And I frankly do not want to live around a bunch of rich white folks. <laughs> <laughs> that is not where I grew up. That is not who I am. I want to move into a I want to move into a community where I can walk to a grocery store when I get when I can't drive anymore where I can get good public transportation for a clinic, where if there are a pile of kids in the street, I'll go make cookies for them. Um, I, that's the kind of multi I like this for a lot of this for us a few years ago. This is, this, these are my folks. I don't have any folks to come right now in San Antonio where I can be sure that community is going to be there. And you can cancel a little bit of land in my place. Okay. I wish there were something. I would like. I would like to invest in this kind of my energy in this kind of community. And I would like to be there. I would like the folks uh, who are in charge of the city to have that same kind of value because, in fact, the attraction of here over Los Angeles, where you've got to drive a zillion miles to get out of the food business, or San Francisco, where you can't afford to live, or Seattle, where I grew up, where you absolutely can't afford to live, not even in the ghetto area where I grew up. None of the kids who grew up there can afford to live. I want to know where I can do this. And I think you folks in the city can help us out. But it's a matter of saying, all right, how do we put all of us in one pot? Because this is what this is this talk is exactly And I just want to tag on to what this gentleman said. I sat here and heard of what his uh, concerns this morning. And my concern goes a little bit different, but I heard the transportation. So I'm going to go to this. And so bear in mind as we go forward that our population of senior growth will be growing. While we talk about the children and all, you know, our population is going to triple, double and triple. We're in excess of 350,000 seniors right now. One in every five, over the age of 65, do not drive anymore. So there's no transportation. Or we're building all sorts of things downtown. We're not thinking about transportation out in the neighborhood. So I, I just hope that that this group will bear that in mind. Population is going to grow. It's going to be seniors. The baby boomers are coming up. So we're going to double and triple. I don't have the amount I'm going to have it the next time I speak at any meeting. I'm going to tell you how many we're going to have in 2020. What the fish are going to be there is that it's So bear in mind, because children are important, the seniors are equally as important. And so when we do this, Identification, that's exactly what we're doing. We're not thinking about the seniors. Thank you. Um, Judith and then Rachel. Um, I'd just like to speak like from a personal experience. I, I find it pretty scary and alarming what's going on. I 
what's going on in the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, close to downtown. Because I lived in Brooklyn 16 years ago, and saw what happened there. And you see, I mean, you've seen like whole communities in Brooklyn just kind of destroyed, and people just keep getting pushed farther out, and pushed farther out, and you know, older people losing their homes, and people feeling like their their beautiful culture. I saw this in Harlem too. Like everything that makes that place special culturally. Not that it's been lost, it's still there, and it, they still claim it, but the people aren't there anymore. And it's, it's just, it's horrifying when you look at it from a way of culture. And I mean, I think in, in some neighborhoods here that could happen, and it's just, it's just not, it's not pretty. And I, I can see it coming, because I've seen that in different cities, and, and I feel like we could really turn it around. It's not too late. It's still a good place to live. It's still, there's, it's still affordable. Um, we can still preserve our culture and our people in that way. So, my name is Rachel, and I took time out from my work schedule to come listen to this because I'm a resident. I don't know what that means now, but uh, I'm very concerned. I, I hear of, know the stories of all these neighborhoods that have changed so much. I live on the west side in the Edgewood ISD, near Las Palmas, near Lake. And my neighborhood has changed a lot. I've lived there all my life. I live in my parents' house, where all the kids were born in the house. I'm still there with my mom. But uh, I'm trying to find out, like, who, how can I make my voice heard? Uh, I see changes coming. I see changes coming to the Spano Shopping Center. I see changes coming to Elmendorf Lake Park. And I just, uh, I want to speak up. Like, who do I talk to? I contacted my city councilwoman, Shirley Gonzalez, who is a lot more accessible than our previous council person. And it's just like, okay, where's their neighborhood association? I've hooked up with the West Side Preservation Alliance because I'm very concerned about our culture, saving some of the old buildings because the buildings are getting knocked down left and right. So something's coming towards us, even in the West Side. There's talk about, like I said, of Las Vegas. Over the years, we've gotten letters from people, from organizations, from businesses saying, are you interested in selling your house? And usually, it's like a, a second house that we have, but now we're getting it for our house. So I'm, I'm here to, okay, who do I talk to? How do I make my voice heard? So that's why I'm here. <laughs> and we do have a representative from District 5. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, and uh, you're absolutely right. The councilwoman is very accessible in District 5. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I'll, I'll touch base with you afterwards, but uh, I know, I mean, she she lives this community. She walks, she runs, she bikes. Uh, what this gentleman was talking about, she feels that District 5 is that community time, and that's what she's trying to get there. Um, obviously, you know, there's people that don't agree with the bike lanes. We spent a million dollars in those bike lanes, now we're going to spend $700,000 to redo them. So, you know, it's kind of how do you keep everyone happy. Um, but that's one of the things, I mean, you need to meet with your council members. You need to let them know how you feel. Uh, the zoning commission, it's, it's, a, it's a government body, but it's actually, they're just, they're kind of just their idea. So they may recommend something for approval, but it's really up to city council. And so if you're in with your city council person or you're actually meeting with them and explaining the situation, the city council person can pull that from the agenda and they won't go any further. So that's one of the things that I want to let some of these folks know because that's part of the process. Um, obviously, what we had at Mission Trails was, I mean, a huge fiasco because the city wasn't prepared for all these folks and how, this, you know, how they were getting displaced and work with the developer and everything. I mean, Councilwoman Gonzalez was the only no vote in the beginning, and then the mayor and, and uh, District 1 also jumped on board where, you know, but you need seven votes to pass, and it passed. So, but what we've learned from that is, now we're trying to get a system in place where we're gonna do something like this, is how do we have these people where we're not displacing folks? We don't wanna make people homeless. We wanna, we want you know, we obviously wanna grow San Antonio, but we wanna, we wanna do it on the backs of other people. And that's where we're, you know, we're learning on how that process, because you're right, development services, they're not very friendly. They're very hard to get around. Uh, Councilwoman Gonzalez has called many of the directors and the, the department heads over there. We've sat them down, we've explained to them that, hey, if we don't understand it, our constituents are going to understand it. And that's what we're trying to make it easier and streamlined for them. 
But um, the, the key is, I think, getting to know your council member and the staff, because a lot of times the council member, it's hard to reach them, but the staff will work it sometimes, you know, 12, 15 hour days just to try and, and answer your questions and get you know, support for you guys. But that, that's the way to do it, is, is get to your council person and get to, and, I, and I'll give you some information at, at, at the end so that we can touch base as well. I think to speak to your question too, Rachel, like, um, you know, one of the, the long-term questions that we're having to, to think through as folks who are organizing around these issues is like, how do you, how do you get in front of the process before it happens so that, or how do you come into the process at the beginning so that you're not constantly having to react to things that are already being decided and already, you know, kind of like the done deal, right? Um, and and it's difficult when I think as both as you know Woody was pointing out, like so much of these processes are happening before it even gets to the point of it being a public process. So what do you do then? What do you do when even if you are in touch with your council person or active in a neighborhood association, it's already too late because the wheels are already in motion. So that's the sort of bigger. Uh, much more difficult question to answer that I would be interested to hear if people have ideas about um, because I think that's the question we're all trying to answer. Refers only to 
the facility. And what we really need to do is talk about community building, the sense of those bonds, caring about knowing who your neighbors are even, for example. And, and there are ways that we could actually even build this into one of the kinds of rewards that people get from making their neighborhood better. Um, for example, community meals, uh, community gardens, community music events. Yeah, all think of all the things that we need in our communities that the market is a terrible way of providing. Uh, for example, live music. Uh, for example, uh, the kinds of things that, that people experience as being not just fun, but heartening about getting connected.